nice thing. You can always address someone without addressing their name. Yeah. <laughs> I work at the end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Immaculate Queen, our holy guardian angels and patron saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, please be seated. 
uh, I w before we get into today's topic, I wanted to mention that in our classes before Easter, like February and March, we were going through different um, accusations against the church, historical, such as the Crusades, the, uh, the, the story of Galileo, uh, there are the Inquisition, all of these topics that anti-Catholics often bring up very much distort history and use it as a, uh, a battering ram to beat, to beat down the church. And I had mentioned this one book, it's called Seven Lies About Catholic History. And I borrowed it from one of our parishioners in Lewiston. It's by a woman named, named Deanne Moksar. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her last name correct. Moksar, Moksar. And she is a PhD history professor at a community college in Virginia. And she wrote a couple of other books. Uh, one is called Islam at the Gates, about Europe's wars with the Ottoman Turks. And another one, 10 Dates That Every Catholic should know historical dates. So she's a history professor. And um, Marilyn read the book, so you thought it was very good? Did yes, you... I love her humor. Very okay. dry humor, like Father mm. Chicago. Yeah, she, she, um, she captions each chapter with a, a basic lie that is accepted by many people as fact. And then she just goes and exposes it. Also, a nice thing in the back of the book is that she has in the appendix, all the sources she used for each chapter, if somebody wanted to read other books about that particular topic. And she says also, I'll just mention this at the beginning, the dedication to William A. Dr. William A. Donahue, founder and president of the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights, a champion debunker of both historical and contemporary lies about the church. Excellent articles in Catalyst, the League's monthly publication, have dealt with some of the lies included in this book, as well as those concerning Pope Pius XII. Now, I've read some of his work, William Donahue. So he founded this organization to defend the church against uh, these attacks. And they're very good, his writings. Now, he's a, you know, he's a conservative in the Novus Ordo, but, but as far as what he writes, it's just basic Catholic history, very good. So I just wanted to mention that I've only read bits and pieces. I should maybe during this summer finish reading that book, but it's, uh, I'm sure, very good. So we, we went through some of those in our apologetics, how to answer some of these criticisms of the church. And then we got into some basic, um, so some specific modern, I don't really want to call them Christian religions because they're, they're such offshoots of Christianity, not like the Protestants. So the last time we covered uh, the Mormons, right? And they, they refer to themselves as, as LDS, the Latter-day Saints. Uh, and the Mormons are very populous in this area, very um, um, well spread out in, in this area. Um, I don't know how many Mormons you'd find back east population-wise, percentage-wise, but a large percentage out here in our area. So we went through that. Today we want to talk about the Jehovah's Witnesses. And again, like, um, like the Mormons, I wouldn't really call it a Christian religion, even though the Mormons believe in Christ. Remember that thing about, you know, if you're a good Mormon, et cetera, you can become a god of your own planet? I mean, just some bizarre. So how would you say that's based on Christianity? I mean, the basic Protestants, at least they say, I believe in the Bible. They have false interpretations about certain things, but basic Protestants believe in the Trinity, the divinity of Christ, et cetera. Uh, and then you get to these religions. Well, we'll cover Jehovah's Witnesses today. They don't believe that Christ is divine. They believe he was St. Michael the Archangel that became a man, just kind of a strange um, mixture of different ideas. And they say they believe in Christ, but it's their own ideas of Christ. So we'll cover that today. And then in one class, in uh, two weeks from today, I want to cover the these last two before we break for the sum summer, the Seventh-day Adventists and the Christian Science. Christian Scientists. Not because they're, um, not because they're 
uh, necessarily similar, but I, I, do, I don't think there, I have as much, I would need as much time to cover those two as for the first two. So we'll get into um, Jehovah's Witnesses, but first of all, a couple stories. So back in 1996, Father Brendan said to me, I'd like to go to Ireland. And he wanted me to go with him to Ireland. So it was a great trip. We had maybe two weeks. We rented a car and drove all over and stayed at B&Bs. But a couple things were very interesting. Every single home in Ireland we stayed, every single one, without exception, had a picture of the Sacred Heart in the living room. Because, you know, a and b you're kind of, you're welcomed in and you're, they welcome you in their living room and then they show you your quarters. Um, Ireland at one time was something like 97% Catholic. Now this is the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, 50-50 Catholic and Protestant. But they've almost totally lost the faith now. But that was, you know, 26 years ago. It was a picture of the Sacred Heart in every home. But one B&B &B where we stayed, this woman said, oh, it's a good thing you had a reservation ahead of time because the Jehovah's are in town. That's the way she called them, the Jehovah's. And we, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're, they're all over Ireland and they're having a big convention in our town this weekend. And every hotel and B&B, &B, everything's booked up. So you're lucky you got a place and all the Jehovah's are coming to town. And so, you know, we asked her about it and she went on to say that all these Catholics she knew were coming, becoming Jehovah's Witnesses. So that was a big thing at that time. One other little story. I was in Omaha a couple years ago at a priest meeting, sitting in the airport, waiting to get on my flight, minding my own business, praying the breviary. <laughs> and this woman came up to me. Now, she was very modestly dressed, very nicely dressed. And of course, I, a typical Jehovah's Witness, as we'll talk about, she wanted to hand me some literature. And, and you know, obviously saw I'm dressed as a clergyman, probably had no idea, you know, what denomination or whatever. And um, she identified herself as Jehovah's Witness. And I said, so you don't believe in the immortality of the soul? You don't believe there's a hell? And I started going like, because I know it. You know, I was asking her questions and she kept saying, oh, well, uh, you should read this. Or you should talk to, and she wanted to give me the name of someone. You talk to him. She couldn't defend what they believe in, but she wanted me to get to read their, their leaflets. And that's one of the things they do is they peddle um, literature and they want to get you to read it. So who are the Jehovah's Witnesses? Now, this book that I'm going to quote extensively from was written in 1958 and revised in 1972. So when it comes to numbers, I presume they're from 72. But I'll read some of it. Um, one of the fastest growing the time this book was written, uh, cultists, bodies of cultists in the world as Jehovah's Witnesses. From 129,000 members in 1949, their numbers have ballooned to 2,200,000 2, in 206 nations. So 129,000 to 2,200,000 from 1949 to either 58 or 72, when it was updated in 72 is probably the 72 numbers. Of these, 505, excuse me, 577,000 reside in this country. So at the time that was written, those are the numbers. He says, Jehovah's Witnesses oppose, this is what are the, some of the things they believe in. They, they oppose blood transfusions, business, Catholics, Christmas trees, com communism, civic enterprises, the doctrines of hell and immortality, evolution, flag saluting, higher education, liquor, lodges, Protestants, priests, the Pope, public office, military service, movies, Mother's Day, religion, Sunday schools, the Trinity, tobacco, the United Nations, voting, and the YMCA. Oh, and Wall Street and women's rights. And he says, this list does not pretend to be conclusive. <laughs> so, you know, complete. So those are some of the things. It's a very, very strange, um, you know, conglomeration of ideas and beliefs. He says, everyone save the lame and the blind is expected to devote many hours a month to door-to-door -door preaching. So they really promote that among their members to go ring doorbells and try and convert uh, others. The cult's modern printing 
Plants in several countries produce more than 100 million books and pamphlets each year, besides Bible and magazines. Bibles and magazines. A witness text, the quote, the truth that leads to eternal life, has become the fourth time all-time bestseller. With 74 million copies in print, it is outranked only by the Bible, quotations from Chairman Mao, and Noah Webster's American Spelling Book. So that was, again, at the time this was written. So this is one of their main ways of promoting their ideas is through printing and handing out. And you could get um, the Watchtower or Awake, there are two magazines, you could sign up for it and get it for free because they really, they really promote these things. So who started it? Uh, it started with a man named Charles Taze Russell. And the early uh, followers, the early, early believers were called Russellites, named after him. Charles Taze Russell was the son of a Pennsylvania haberdasher he adopted Adventist views after a congregational boyhood and a temporary loss of faith. Now, if you don't recall what the Congregationalists are, they were the early pilgrims that came to Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts. C Congregationalism was an offshoot of the Anglican religion because you had Anglican or Episcopalian under, after Henry VIII and under Elizabeth, and they maintained the structure of the Roman Catholic Church, that is bishop and priests. Then the Presbyterians came along, started by John Knox in England, and they didn't believe there should be any priests, I'm sorry, any bishops. They abhorred the idea of bishops, so they only had priests. That's what we're called the presbyters, Presbyterians. Well, then there were others who said, we shouldn't even have priests, and each congregation should be totally de democratic and elect their ministers. You don't have any ord ordination, any ordained clergy, and they became known as Congregationalists. So basically, they're like Engl English Protestants who came to this country. So he was raised a Congregationalist, lost his faith for a while, and then he started his own religion. He became distressed at the thought of hell, and his Bible searching convinced him that the Hebrew word Sheol should invariably be translated as grave instead of hell. He began his preaching activities in 1872, and many people found comfort in his flat denial of everlasting punishment. Now, who's not living a bad life that wouldn't like that idea, that there is no everlasting punishment? So he started in 1872 preaching. He hadn't really formed yet, so to speak, a separate denomination. But this is the beginnings of the Jehovah's Witness religion. Um, Pastor Russell, as he was called, toured the nation, preaching his novel biblical interpretations on an average of six to eight hours a day. But two scandals rocked his new movement. His wife sued him for divorce, charging him with infidelity and cruelty. And the, the court declared, quote, his course of conduct toward his wife evidences such insistent egotism and extravagant self-praise that it would be manifest to the jury that it would necessarily render the life of any sensitive Christian woman an intolerable burden. Russell contested the divorce five times without success and eventually attempted to avoid alimony payments by transferring his property to corporations which he controlled. Uh, the cult's leader, Russell, uh, his involvement in a phony $60 a bushel miracle wheat disillusioned other converts. He also promoted a cancer cure, which consisted of a caustic paste of chloride of zinc, a wonderful millennial bean, and fantastic, a fantastic cotton seed. So he had all these little side ventures, sorry. Russell died in 1916. Um, his successor was Joseph P. Rutherford. Now, Joseph Rutherford was a small town lawyer in the Midwest somewhere. And because he had been a lawyer, he became known to his followers as Judge Rutherford. And he is the real founder of Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witnesses as they are today. Because Russell laid the foundations of his ideas of rejecting hell and the immortality of the soul 
but Rutherford is what really built it up. It, it was, there, there weren't that many followers, the Russellites. But once he started, he's the one that started the door-to-door -door proselytism. And he, he um, recorded sermons and his followers would take these little portable phonographs around from home to home and people who are foolish enough to invite them into their living room, then they would play these sermons for them by Judge Rutherford. So he took over again in, I think, 1916. Well, at least that's when Russell died, so 16 or 17, right about that time. Judge Joseph Rutherford was a small town, town Missouri lawyer who preferred writing to preaching. He consolidated Russellism, quietly supplanted the founder in the memory of the devotees. His scripture-heavy polemics soon formed the bulk of the sect's printed propaganda. Later, he recorded the short talks which witnesses played for households on their portable phonographs. He also shrugged off Russell's pyramidism, that is, a system by which the founder, Russell, claimed to be able to foretell history by measuring the rooms of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. So Russell had some strange ideas and, and Rutherford kind of adopted his basic ideas and got rid of some and then and then formed it into the, you know, the Jehovah's Witness religion. During World War I, Rutherford and other officers of the cult were imprisoned for nine months on charges of sedition. Shortly after his release from Atlanta Federal Prison, the judge, as they called him, coined the slogan, millions now living will never die, which expressed the urgently Adventist hopes of the movement. So, it mentions the Adventist idea, and this has to do with what's called millennialism. And we're going to get into that uh, in two weeks in our next class on the 16th of June, because there the Seventh-day Adventists are even more into it than the Jehovah's Witnesses, but Rutherford was also into this idea. So million, he said, millions now living will never die. Well, of course, he died, and other people that believed him died, so how are they gonna explain that? So we'll get into that. Um, it says that uh, in 1931, Rutherford disclosed that their new name would be Jehovah's Witnesses. So he gave it that name, 1931. And so really, if you're gonna look for the founder, I would say Judge Rutherford was really the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses. He borrowed the initial ideas from Russell, but he's really the founder of, you know, of the movement. Uh, their headquarters are in Brooklyn, New York. When not at his Brooklyn uh, office, Judge Rutherford resided in a mansion near San Diego, whose deed was made out to Abel, Noah and Abraham. The estate was kept in readiness for any Old Testament princes who would return to life before the Battle of Armageddon. Meanwhile, it served as the Western headquarters. The judge, as he was referred to, was not among the millions now living who will never die. He died in 1942 after dictating the affairs of the cult for more than 25 years. So he died in, what did I say, 1942? Uh, and then they've had, obviously, successive. The, they have a leader that would be similar to a pope in the Catholic Church, where his word is final and he has complete control. And then he has officers uh, with him. Many basic teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses resemble those of Seventh-day Adventists, which, again, we'll get to uh, in more detail through whom Russell was introduced to millennial doctrines. Now, briefly, millennial, you, you kind of see the word, uh, well, mille is a Latin word for a thousand, not a million, a thousand. Millennialism is the idea that Christ will come back to the earth and reign on the earth for a thousand years. And you hear that a lot among different Protestants. So where does that come from? Well, actually, it comes from the apocalypse. And it's mentioned the reign of a thousand years. Well, how does the church understand that? What do the fathers of the church have to say? We're going to get into that at next class because the Seventh-day Adventists are more into that than Jehovah's Witnesses, I would say. So we'll, we'll get into that idea. Where does it come from? What do they exactly mean and so forth? 
Uh, so he borrowed that idea from the Seventh-day Adventists who started earlier, like mid-1800s. Uh, uh, so um, he died in 1942. All right. Um, many of his teachings resemble those of Seventh-day Adventists through whom he was introduced to millennial doctrines. Mankind, he says, live, lives in the latter days. The great battle between Satan and Christ, Armageddon, may occur any day now. Prepare. The witnesses, his followers, have learned by experience not to specify dates, but all members confidently expect to see these events in their lifetime, at least before 1984. So this again was written in 1958 and revised in 1972. So at that time, they still believe it's going to happen by 1984. Uh, you know, and every few years, I remember there was some wacko Protestant preacher about maybe five years ago, you know, talking about the end of the world and then it didn't happen and they asked him, well, I guess I was wrong on that. But every, you hear about these, you know, these uh, self-styled prophets and so forth coming out with their predictions for the end of the world every, every now and then. Satan, according to, this is what they believe, Satan was cast out of heaven and now rules the world. However, Jesus Christ returned to the earth invisibly in 1914. Why 1914? I don't know. Uh, according to Rutherford, we have already entered the earth early days of the millennium, which will terminate in A.D. 2914. But only a few people recognize the theocracy. These few include the Jehovah's Witnesses. At the end of this 1,000 years, Satan will be loosed and he will try one last time to seduce mankind. A few men will succumb to his temptations and then with Satan they will be annihilated. Satan and those that follow him. And I, I skipped part of this. He was saying that, after, that sometime during this 1,000 years there will be this battle of Armageddon and the good will be like up in the mountains watching it down below and everybody will be wiped out except them and then they will repopulate the world and most people will be good but then there'll be a few wicked and you know and then at the end of this thousand years they will be annihilated he says a few men will succumb to his temptations and with satan will be annihilated the billions who have repopulated the earth and and been resurrected from the dead will continue to dwell on earth forever only a fraction of Jehovah's Witnesses can be members of the invisible church since they believe that its number is fixed to 144,000. So there's three places, or three, uh, I should say, three things that happen to human beings after their life on earth, right? There's heaven, and that will be 144,000, no more, no less. Right? Then there's earth and a nice, blessed, happy life on earth forever. That will be all the rest who were good that aren't part of the bride's class. They call this the bride's class. And the interesting thing about that, they have a ceremony every spring of a communion in the kingdom hall. Their, their churches are called kingdom halls. And they have this communion service and only those who believe that they're in the bride's class can partake of it. So how do you know? You know, they, 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 they said there were, at the time this was written, there were 1,087 or something like that in the United States at the time that claimed that they were part of the bride's class, whatever. So this is all the rest of the good. And then there's no hell, of course. So what is their annihilation? For the wicked because that way nobody goes to hell because they're just poof they're gone they're just annihilated their soul uh, is annihilated so that's what they believe um talking about this bride's class uh, only a few can entertain hopes of reaching heaven one out of 500 witnesses claims to belong to this bride's class this select group they are the only ones who partake of the annual spring observance of the Lord's Supper in local kingdom halls. Now, you might say, where did they, you know, pull this number out of a hat? Where do you get 144,000 only? Well, do you remember the epistle on All Saints Day, November 1st? 
And it's the angel came and he signed 12,000 of this tribe and 12,000 of that tribe. And he lists 12 tribes, 12,000 of each tribe. Yes, but then read on. What does St. John say? He says, after this, I saw a multitude which no man can number out of every nation under heaven. You know, talking about the, the all, seeing all the saints in heaven, a multitude which no man can number. So all you have to do is just keep on reading after the 12,000 signed. And, and of course, those were of the tribes of Israel. And all of that is symbolic as well. All right. So that's what they, part of what they believe. To summarize, the final disposition of mankind, according to Russell and Rutherford, and then whoever currently runs it, 144,000 will attain heaven and reign with Christ. The wicked will be annihilated. The righteous will live on earth forever. Witnesses reject many fundamental Christian beliefs, such as original sin, the divinity of Christ, his resurrection, immortality, and the Trinity. They say that Christ was originally St. Michael the Archangel. He lived and died as a man and is now an exalted being. He was not God. They reject his divinity. This is a quote from one of their books. Prior to coming to earth, this only begotten Son of God did not think himself to be co-equal with Jehovah God. He did not view himself as equal in power and glory with Almighty God. He did not follow the course of the devil and plot and scheme to make himself like or equal to the Most High God and to rob God or usurp God's place. On the contrary, he showed his subjection to God as his superior by humbling himself under God's almighty hand, even to the most extreme degree, which means to a most disgraceful death on a torture stake." Unquote. So that's from a book called Let God Be True. So it's very clear they do not believe that Christ is divine. Like Arianism, Arius rejected divinity of Christ, so likewise Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, they have a high regard for Arius, among other heretics. Um, they agree with the Seventh-day Adventists on immortality. Quote, and this is another quote from a standard book of Jehovah's Witnesses. Quote, immortality is a reward for faithfulness. It does not come automatically to a human at birth. They ridicule the doctrine of the Trinity. Another quote from their books. Quote, when the clergy are asked by their followers as to how such a combination of three and one can possibly exist, they are obliged to answer that is a mystery. Some will try to illustrate it by using triangle, trefoils, or images with three heads on one neck. Nevertheless, sincere persons who want to know the true God and serve him find it a bit difficult to love and worship a complicated, freakish-looking, three-headed God. The clergy who inject such ideas will contradict themselves in the very next breath by stating that God made man in his own image, for certainly no one has ever seen a three-headed human creature. So really blasphemous um, you know, statements that they have in their books. The Jehovah's Witnesses consider all religious bodies, Catholic and Protestant, to be tools of Satan and deceivers, but they reserve a special hatred for Roman Catholicism. Their literature offers kind words for Arius, Waldo, Wycliffe, Huss, and other, and the early Anabaptists, but they lament that the Reformation never really got off the ground. But the, again, a particular detestation for uh, Roman Catholicism. Now, what's interesting in these four groups is that they all have the idea that they're the only ones right. And that if you're not part of them, you're in a false religion. Whereas the mainstream Protestants, so like Lutherans and Anglicans and Baptists and Presbyterians, you know, they'll dif disagree with one another on certain things, but they still have the idea that we're all part of the Christian church. They don't condemn one another to the same degree like Jehovah's Witnesses would condemn Mormons and they would condemn Seventh-day Adventists and Roman Catholics and Protestants and so forth. Some Protestant churches, I, I'm not going to have too much more to read, but a few more sections I want to read. Some Protestant churches ask no more of a prospective member than that he sign the register, attend church with some regularity, promise to read the Bible, and contribute to the support of the church. Not so with Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyone who conscientiously meets the demands of the cult finds little time for anything else. 
A convert completes courses in the Bible, speech, salesmanship, and missionary techniques before being assigned to ring doorbells with an experienced witness. Most members hold regular jobs and attempt to get their required hours, evenings, and weekends. Um, a Jehovah's Witness is encouraged to live and eat decently, but invited to turn over any surplus wealth to the cult. So they really strongly urge their members to, you know, to donate so they can carry on these evangelical um, missions. Witnesses do not vote in local or national elections, hold public office, salute the flag, or enter military service, since they consider the United States government, and every other government for that matter, an instrument of the devil. On this score, one government is about as wicked as another, be it democratic, fascist, or communist. To cast a vote or accept a public office would be supporting Satan's political ally. Oddly enough, they have never objected to paying taxes. At one time, the sect discouraged marriage and the begetting of children since the theocracy was just around the corner, but this prohibition has since been relaxed. Um, they have this big center in Brooklyn, New York, a uh, big house called Bethel House, a nine-story apartment building where many of them live and work on publishing things and answering mail and that type of thing. Sundays and Thursday evenings, meetings resemble discussion groups more than worship services. Prayer, study of scripture, and watchtower publications, reports of activities, and business comprise the meetings. Hymn singing is not is considered a waste of time, is not encouraged, and music has played a very minor role in their assemblies. In recent years, Jehovah's Witnesses have learned how to smile, to treat householders with some courtesy and tact, to inquire by, about the children and pet the dog. The old-fashioned belligerency and hear me or be damned approach antagonized many prospects. So they've learned to be salesmen. Um, many of the members, very few, go on to college. And it mentions here they don't encourage, you know, uh, further education. So high school uh, education is normally uh, what you'll find among the members. Between 1940 and 1945, almost 2,000 Jehovah's Witnesses were sent to federal prison as draft dodgers, although all claimed to be ministers of the gospel. They have won about two-thirds of the 40 cases which have reached the Supreme Court. In most instances, they were supported by the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. Um, and in typical witness gratitude, they have branded the ACLU as an agent of the devil. Well, we know many things that the ACLU will promote and advocate for, and we would, we would agree to a great degree with that. But here, they were defending them because they thought, well, they have the right to believe what they want to believe, so we'll defend them in court. And then they turn around and call them an agent of the devil. It's interesting. Uh, where are they found? Now, when this book was written, besides the United States, they were found in Nigeria, Brazil, West Germany, Mexico, British Isles, and the Philippines, um, uh, among other where countries where there's the largest, a large percentage of them. So it's it's really kind of a strange religion and. You know, I don't, I don't run into a lot of them. You see more Mormons out there doing their two-year service, going and ringing doorbells and going around there on pedaling their bikes or whatever, you know, two by two. Um, but these three, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Seventh-day Adventists all tend to be very, uh, very uh, passionate about promoting their particular sect, their particular beliefs, and trying to gain converts. But I just don't know that Jehovah's Witnesses are that populous anymore as a percentage. Uh, Mormons seem to be growing, growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, people like Glenn Beck, you know, have fallen for Mormonism. Um, but um, Jehovah's Witnesses, I, you just don't hear of anybody that's prominent that, that I have heard. Of course, they, they're against public office and things of that nature. Uh, you, there's a lot of a lot of Mormons in, um, you know, like Mitt Romney, or who was the guy that just died in Nevada, the longtime Democrat senator from Nevada that just died. 
what Harry Reid was, a, and you know, a number of Mormons in Congress. So you, you get Mormons in higher positions in government and so forth and prominent positions, but I, you just don't find that among Jehovah's Witnesses, especially because of their view. So I don't know that it's very prominent. My guess is that far more um, non-Catholics who are into a religion are the evangelicals. That's what's been growing by leaps and bounds. The, the, uh, leaps and bounds. I mentioned before these mega churches. You know, we, we have, what, what is the one down in, a couple of them down in Post Falls, you know, where they're, they're huge. And they have traffic, you know, cops out there on Sundays or whenever they go there because there's so many cars that go to these new life and these different kind of churches. They're big churches and they're not denominational. They're not Lutheran, Baptist, you know, Methodist, Presbyterian, Anglican, whatever. They're just, they're just, they're called evangelical. They're non-denominational and they're just about the Bible and that type of thing. So that's what, in the, in the 21st century, that's what you find a very um, um, prominent. And Jehovah's Witnesses, to me, seems to be kind of fading away. But there still are them. You, find, you see their churches, it's called the Kingdom Hall. Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they, it's, it's fairly recently, meaning in the last 50 or so years, that they've had more churches because they used to rent spaces, almost like an office space, just for meetings. They kind of frowned on the idea of having a church. And of course, they don't call it a church, it's a kingdom hall, a kingdom hall. So that's uh, Jehovah's Witness religion. One more black eye for us because it came from the United States of America, like Mormonism and like the other two that we'll discuss in a couple of weeks. All right, let's, yes, one question here. So what, what do the evangelicals believe? Evangelicals believe in the Bible. That's it. And private interpretation, so the basic Lutheran idea that the Bible alone, no tradition, private interpretation, you know, of the Bible, and faith in Christ saves you. So the basic Protestant tenets, but they don't, want to be part of a denomination like the you you hear of like the lutheran missouri synod or these different groups where they're they're, they're not part of a group you, your your local protestant evangelical church in post falls or coeur d'alene is not part of a network you see what i mean each one is kind of independent yeah they communicate with one another but there's not like a an, an overall structure that governs them and there is with Lutherans, you know, they're part of this group, the Missouri Synod, or that group, and the Methodists, same way. You know, they they have some kind of a structure where there's large numbers of churches that... They just have meetings where the pastor or whoever he is, he yeah. gets up and he just reads a part from the Bible. Right, and gives a sermon. The sermon is the big thing, and the music. Oh, the music is very big with them. And the prayer, they only say a couple prayers, you know, and then people go up to be healed. A lot of them have that, you know, lay their hands on them and they, you know, pray for them. Let's pray for Joe or Sue or whatever. And he'll lay his hands on her. And um, there was um, a pastor, as they call them, in California. I'm sure he's still alive. I don't know if you remember back when Obama, what was the, who did Obama, what was the first election? Was he against um, Bob Dole, or who, who was it? I can't remember who was the Republican nominee. But the two of them, McCain. Yeah. McCain, yeah, John McCain, and this, this evangelical minister in California has a church of like 10,000 people, well, yeah, services, and it can hold 10,000 people. And, and it's live streamed and all this kind of thing. And he had an interview with both presidential candidates, and they were looking for him to endorse them because of his influence was so great. And he wrote a couple books that are very prominent among Protestants, you know, and it's all, it's all, it's kind of like the self-help, you know, that type of thing. And they're, they're very um, popular among, among Protestants. So it just seems to me from what I've read that Protestantism outside of, you know, these groups, which really aren't Protestants, but outside of that, Protestantism has been drifting away for the last 50, 60 years from the denominations, as it has been for several hundred years, into these mega churches of non-denominational, just, they'll just call them Bible churches, you know, where they, they read and talk about the Bible. But people will go to find a church they're comfortable with. They like this minister. They like his sermons. They like the music in that church. And some of these big churches, they have a staff of anywhere from five to 10, even 12 people, 
on the church payroll and they work during the week on the liturgy or whatever you want to call it, the service for the next Sunday. They, they plan the music, they work on it, and they'll have skits. A lot of these churches have skits or plays where they go up to. You go into a lot of these churches, they have a coffee bar. You know where you go in? They have ba baby uh, you know, care, uh, nursery or whatever. Um, and you know, it's just a big, um, uh, it's just like a big joyful um, you know, celebration type well, of thing. Well, the kind of like that, mm -hmm. in Coeur d'Alene, mm -hmm. but that's Salvation Army. That's right, yeah, Salvation Army, right. yeah. The Salvation Army has shied away from pushing their religion as much as others, because they advertise themselves more as helping the poor and that type of thing is their, is their main thing. But yeah, that's another one we could look into. All right, well, let's have a blessing. Benedictio omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat Supervos et Maniat Semper. Amen. So all I can think of is thank God for our Catholic faith, right? Poor people.